everyone, and welcome to our first webinar as part of Asset Management Awareness Month. We're really glad that you are all able to join us today. Um, we've got a great presentation planned from Dr. Getz. Um, I have a couple of announcements to get through before we jump into the presentation. While I'm going through those announcements, if, if you have not already done so, if you could please take a look at the poll question on your screen and go ahead and respond to that poll. That'll just help us to get a little bit more information about the group as we're getting started. So the notes that I want to go through, um, first of all, we are recording this presentation and we'll be sharing it on our YouTube channel. So just keep that in mind as you're asking questions throughout the presentation, uh, that those will be um, part of the recording. Um, there are a couple of ways that you can ask the questions throughout the presentation or at the end of the presentation, preferably. Um, the first option is to raise your hand, and that will let me know that you need to ask a question out loud. So in order to raise your hand, you'll notice in the GoToWebinar panel on your screen, to the left of your name, there's a little hand icon. If you click on that hand, I'll know that you have a question, and at the end of the presentation, I'll give you an opportunity to ask your question. If you do not have your audio pin entered, if you're on the telephone, then I will not be able to unmute you to ask a question. So if you have not entered your audio pin, go ahead and do that. If you are using your computer mic and speakers, then you're good to go. If you would prefer to ask a question anonymously, then please use the questions panel and go ahead and just type in your question. If you do that, I will ask the question for you, but not announce your name so we can keep that anonymous. One other quick note about questions. Um, I see that we've got some hands up already. Um, the button is very sensitive, so just everyone might want to take an opportunity just to check and see if you've accidentally raised your hand. Um, that way I won't uh, call on you and, and have an awkward silence when you don't realize you're being unmuted. Um, so those are the options we have for questions. Um, next announcement, NPMA is going to be providing everyone that is attending live today that is an NPMA member with a CEU credit. If you are in a group in a conference room or with your chapter, for example, please either chat to me or email to me the list of members that are attending with you in the group so I can make sure that those that are not logged on personally are getting credit for participating today. And finally, um, a couple of you will win Amazon gift cards um, by random drawing for participating today, and I will send that Send the winner announcements out um, sometime over the next couple of days. All right, let me close the poll. It looks like most of us have voted. I'm going to share the results. Okay, so the question for the group, how frequently does your organization perform self-assessment? 5% um, of you say never. Most of you, a really large number of you, 89%, say annually, 5% um, every two years, 1% every three years, and no one said every four years or longer. Um, so that's great information. So Doug, you've got a lot of people that do annual assessments in the group. Um, so let me hide this whole question. Thank you all for participating. And now everyone should see Dr. Getz's presentation on the screen. So. Doug, I am going to turn this over to you at this time. Very good. Thank, thank you, Jessica. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining this uh, webinar on uh, uh, self-assessment as the primary focus within it. Uh, there was a lot of discussion as to different topics. I was glad that they allowed me to do this. I have a, a ton of material to go through, and, and we can spend a, a week or two weeks covering the self-assessment process in great detail, but what I have to do is give you a distillation of all of this in about an hour. So, ladies and gentlemen, if, if you're ready, we're, we're going to see what we can do here and, and go through all of this on, on this wonderful world of, of self-assessments here. So, um, where does all of this information come from? First off, I'm not making this stuff up. I, I hear a lot of people say, well, we do it this way, that way, the other way. No, that's not good enough in this day and age. We must base our actions based upon regulatory requirements, voluntary consensus standards, information that's already out there. There are a ton of audit books out there. Uh, we can look at generally accepted audit standards, GAS. We can look at the government's auditing standards, 
Uh, she's gone off doing singing lately. Her name is Lady Gaga. That was meant to be humorous. It's generally accepted government auditing standards, G-A-G-A-S. So you see where that is. I've given you the links to a number of these things where you can download them for your library. Uh, there's a textbook that I'm working on, uh, and we hope that NPMA will publish it on this specific uh, issue, that being uh, DOD and, and other uh, um, uh, government agencies doing system analysis, uh, property management system analysis. But more importantly, it, it has applicability to contractors doing self-assessment. One of the best things out there is the ASTM, uh, Standard Guide for Contractor Self-Assessment, uh, 2936, Brandon Kreiner was the, the chair of that standard, did a great job uh, herding all of us cats that were on the committee. Uh, so it's a very useful document. There's old DOD guidance out there. Of course, the old property manual, which has been dead for a goodly number of years, but it had some interesting discussion about auditing, its original incarnation, per se, as to how to do PMSAs with applicability of self-assessment. You need to understand what the DOD guidebook is out there, the latest iteration dated December 14th. You should also look at DCMA property management uh, guidance, the instruction 124. And, and the last item on this slide is uh, from the National Defense Industries Association, NDIA. If you look at their government property tools, uh, they have guidance for self-assessment. So what I've tried to do is, is cobble together a whole bunch of material from legitimate sources discussing for us the issue of self-assessment. Lots of literature out there, lots of textbooks, lots of material. So this is that amalgam trying to provide you a framework of a, a doing a self-assessment. So the first place I had to go is one of the, the NPMA sites, the NPMA literature, the books that talked about doing uh, an audit per se, using an audit process, stating the objectives, defining attributes. Uh, it was a 10-step, really 11-step process that if you go back to some of the NPMA manuals, you would find discussion of this. And what I'd like to do for a few minutes now is walk you through what these individual steps mean and, and a little bit of their application and then dig really deep, do a, a deep dive onto a couple of them, right? So I want to walk through this with some emphasis later. First thing, objectives of the audit test. What are you testing? What are you evaluating? What are you auditing? Or in this case, in a self-assessment, what are you assessing? What process or outcome? If you're a far performing contractor, you do have the requirement to perform self-assessments. Uh, and, and for any of you who said you do not do self-assessments, I, I assume that None of you were contractors under a FAR government property clause because, well, you'd uh, not be doing what your contract requires. So I imagine there are some government people online or, or other entities that are not working under FAR-based contracting. So first off, we would be looking at we doing a self-assessment, thinking about this, planning this. Uh, what are we going to test? The acquisition of, of stuff, how our acquisition process works. The receiving of stuff, how you receive property into your system, what documentation will you use, what records are you going to maintain? Are you going to maintain a, uh, an, an automated system using any of the uh, number of software packages out there? How are you going to perform physical inventories? What methodology are you going to use? What, what time frame will this be accomplished in? Uh, are, are you going to do wall to wall? Are, are you going to do an inventory by exception? All of these things are really determining, before you even start, what are you going to do during this self-assessment? What are you going to test? And this is something that, that I really like to use a, a team process for, sitting down and determining the scope of the audit. You need to define what attributes or transactions coming out of the audit world. Are you testing attributes or are you testing transactions, right? Uh, quantities posted? Is the record accurate? Is it in accordance with the procedures? In other words, these criteria that you're going to be evaluating, testing, assessing, you need to establish these before your audit. You need to think through and ask the question, what am I going to audit? And there are 
many, many sources of information in that regard that you could find sample worksheets out there, guidance out there as to some of the criteria uh, that you would be looking at uh, in this and whether it's going to be testing as an attribute, which I'm going to talk about later, or as a transaction. We're going to get into that a little bit bigger. You also have to need to be aware about how you define populations. Uh, a population is going to be those source documents that are going to be subject to review, collecting, smushing together uh, to create them. And, and these can be based upon whatever process you're testing or a process segment or even going down so much as to a criteria. But one of the things when we define a, a population is we're looking for common characteristics. Now, I use the fancy word there. We're looking for homogeneity. But really, that's saying common characteristics. And I'll show you a few areas where people have tried to lump uh, processes together. And unfortunately, they don't meet the test of common characteristics. We might also be looking at a, a respective time frame that generally uh, within transactions, DOD says to go back one year, 365 days. For some of you who are old timers, there, there, were, uh, there was guidance where we could go out and test on a 90-day basis or a 180-day basis. Uh, in, in discussions with statisticians, uh, the pure folks who, who analyze statistics, they said, no, 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 that's, that's not good enough. Technically, you need to go back one year or to the last assessment, to the last analysis. So within that guide, uh, guidance, we, we go to the experts and find out what they meant by a time frame. And for audit purposes, that was going back one year. My little note there says it's probably the most critical step in the entire process. I'll show you that later because if you do it wrong, you're going to have an error, an error that comes up from statistical analysis. I'll, I'll show you that. All right. Uh, a second note, let, be careful about lumping processes that have dissimilar source documents. I'll talk about that also. Right. Item four is you have to specify the acceptance and rejection rates. Two word answer here. As you've heard me say many times, it depends. Both the DOD guidebook and DCMA one, uh, Instruction 124 have three different confidence levels for specifying the acceptance or rejection rates, 90, 95, 97%. This came out of a DLA ops research report, uh, which we still have copies of explaining using a double hypermetric G, uh, distributional. For those of you who love algebra and statistics, it's wonderful. The rest of us, we have to take it on faith that the numbers that they're giving us at this 90, 95, and 97% confidence rates are correct. I'll show you those tables. If we were to look at the ASTM standard that I mentioned earlier, uh, that also contains those DOD confidence rate tables, but there are others out there. Uh, ASTM standard 2234 uh, has product by attributes index by AQL, an acceptable uh, a quality level. That also provides other sampling plans. Uh, the government, DOD in this case, uh, does not tell you which sampling plan to use. Rather, there are some broad general guidelines that you'd want to look at. We'll, we'll get into that, all right? Uh, determine your sample size. Well, if you use any of those tables found in 2936, it tells you. If you have population of X, you would use a sample size of Y. Uh, case in point, if my population range is between 400 and item, 401 items and 10,000 items, I'm going to pull 34 random samples in my sample. Now, I do have the note down at the bottom that it is a double sampling plan. As such, really, you're going to select two samples of 34 just in case you have some errors, uh, deficiencies, defects uh, within your first sample. The table does go on to tell you to use and select that second sample. So it's always better to do it uh, as at the same time so you don't have to worry about uh, the same numbers uh, cropping up in your second sample. You, you don't want to test the same items 
that you did in your first sample, right? Uh, interesting stuff there. How do you select that sample? Lots of different ways. Uh, most of the folks that I've talked to out there from my, my classes, from uh, various uh, workshops I've given, use this wonderful little little website called randomizer.org. It allows you to actually provide that specificity. Uh, uh, Microsoft Excel has a methodology to select random numbers. Uh, Random.org is another site. You could use a simple mathematical sampling process, either stratified sampling or systemic systematic sampling. Uh, there are random number tables. I, I have the link displayed there with NIST. Uh, it it provide you as a standard uh, random number tables. And if any of you have taken a statistics class, virtually every stat book at the end has random number tables, right? Um, perform the audit process, uh, population, sample selected, all that good stuff. Uh, prepare your work papers. And during that audit, you're going to be collecting and documenting audit evidence. Audit evidence is critical because we have a, a number of court cases that really disparaged the auditor because they, multiple auditors, failed to, to provide audit evidence as to why they did things and how they made their decisions. Uh, in some legal cases, up to the tune of $25 million against the government because they failed to follow audit procedures there. Uh, the audit standards, the audit rules as to what they needed to do. Analyze the defects. Oh, I'm going to spend some time here because th this is where for the goodly number of years, I have seen people confuse issues of significance and materiality and take only a quantitative approach and don't look at things qualitatively. Hey, we're going to look at some of those and ask you to make some of those decisions whether a system is satisfactory or unsatisfactory, adequate or inadequate, we're going to let you make a few decisions based upon some data that I will provide you. Once you have all of that, uh, if you chose random samples, you have the legitimate ability to generalize. Generalize from that small number of sample items in your sample back to that larger population. That's one of the benefits of statistics and we're gonna we're gonna see some of that at the end and then determine your your rating of that that system all right uh, do you have a good system an adequate system an acceptable system or might you have a, a system that has inadequacies that it's rated as unacceptable or or if you really get technical calling it yucky you know uh, you also have to determine if there's a need for corrective action system defects or maybe just correction of the disclosed items with no systemic correction, depending upon which methodology you use for reviewing that, whether you use the statistical sample or a judgment sample and the ability to then generalize, right? And where I was chided was that I had not put into my original articles or into the NPMA uh, manuals that we had to write a report. Well, of course. Every time we do any type of study, there comes out of that study, that survey, that analysis, that assessment, uh, a formal written report as to the, the outcome of that. So I will plead mea culpa there. The 11th step, of course, is to write that report. So based upon audit literature, that's a formal process. Generally, most of us are, uh, uh, are subject to property management system analyses done by one of the government agencies, either DCMA, Defense Contract Management Agency, or for some of you at the university level, Office of Naval Research. <clears throat> but uh, th this talk today is I, I wanted to talk about self-assessments using that, that audit protocol. So how do we do that? We got to keep digging there. So our first requirement, for, for those people who said they've never done a self-assessment, if you are a contractor and you're dealing with the government property clause of 52245-1, it states under the, the uh, big super paragraph B, paragraph B, that the contractor shall establish and maintain procedures necessary to assess its property management system effectiveness and shall perform 
internal reviews, and audits. Notice there are three words there, assess, review, audit. You get your choice as to methodologies you're going to use. Different things mean different items. Different words mean different applications. So we, we sort of have to be a little bit fussy about that. And then the last sentence says, look, if you find a significant issue, significant findings, those are to be made available to your government property administrator. Now, now the point there, the bottom bullet that I have, the government does not tell the contractor how to do this. Contractors, those of you in the audience, it is your responsibility to design and develop this self-assessment based upon literature that's out there as to doing that. So I got a couple little things here that I'm going to steal from the government first and then show you an application, right? So a good question, how frequently shall a government PA perform a property management system audit, property management system analysis? And you all know my answer to that. It depends, right? Current thinking, it depends upon the risk rating assigned by the property administrator to the contractor's property management system. And within that, it has an impact on frequency, frequency of doing those audits. So here are our, our levels uh, uh, of risk ratings, high risk. Hopefully none of you listening to this today are viewed as a high risk contractor. Determined by the CEO as being uh, undocumented, inconsistent, chaotic contractor processes, uh, security concerns, cost, schedule of performance, OMG, you do not want to be a high-risk contractor. That's, that's the worst position you can place yourself into. That is the worst position to place your company into. Moderate risk? Okay, there are a few other things there. Uh, yes, you're, you're approved, but uh, there's a little bit of uncertainty there. Uh, you might be an inexperienced contractor. You might be deploying a new property management system, or maybe you have new management coming in. And they don't like anything that you're doing, and they say, no, 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 we're going to do this my way. And regrettably, sometimes they may be oblivious to the requirements of the government property clause, the clauses that are out there, or the related clauses. The last one, this is where you want to be, contractors. You want to be a low-risk contractor, that your work is consistent with the terms and conditions of the contract supported through all levels of management. Oh, wouldn't that be wonderful? And more and more I'm seeing where management does recognize uh, the requirements of property and they are supporting the property function. But as everything else in life, there are some folks that uh, just, just don't pay attention until bad things happen, right? Contractor focuses continuously on improving its processes through both incremental and technological, well-managed, effective, efficient, consistently produce positive results, all right? Cost, schedule, performance are not in danger. In other words, you're doing a great job. Cool. All of that's coming out of DCMA's guidance to its government employees. And then they tag onto that the issue of when to perform the, the, the audits. If you're high risk, it says at least annually. If you're a moderate risk contractor, at least once every two years, a biennial basis. Low risk contractor, at least once every three years. So your goal should be to move <coughs> to that low risk status that you're viewed with high esteem uh, by your, your government PA. And again, this is coming out of DOD or DCMA's guidance to its property administrators. So I can imagine some of you are out there saying, Doug, 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 wait, wait, wait. All that deals with the government auditing the contractor. But this, this workshop is on contractor self-assessment. So I want to know how frequently should I as a contractor uh, do my self-assessment. So here we go. Everybody wait for it. Here it comes. And what do you think the next three, two words are going to be? It depends. All right. Come on, I can't give you a blanket statement that in all situations, this is the way that would occur. But look, 
The government doesn't prescribe nor mandate a specific frequency. Contractors, based upon either internal policies or procedures or criteria similar to the government's, or based upon the 2936 ASTM VCS, should establish frequency. And surprisingly enough, that frequency is the same as specified for the government. Here's 2936, a VCS that you as a contractor are encouraged to use. The FAR says you may use VCSs. That's great. And uh, I, I have to admit that we reiterated the government's approach. Why reinvent the wheel? Do what exists out there if there is efficacy to it. The frequency of a contractor's self-assessment performance, either complete or individual processes, should be based upon a risk assessment. 6.2.3.1, low risk entities, once every three years. Medium risk entities, once every two years. High risk entities, annually. And from the poll that Jessica took right at the beginning of this workshop, it appears that most of you are following that type of protocol because we said annually, biennially, triennially. Oh, that was cool, giving us some data out of that. Okay, next step then, one area that I find lacking is folks just don't read their procedures. Before any audit, a PMSA, or a self-assessment, you should do a thorough read of your property management systems procedures. What did you say you were going to do? This isn't what you want them to do. This isn't what you think they need to do. Rather, this is what you put down in writing as your standard of performance that you are going to do X, Y, and Z. Read your procedures. And that's on both sides, government and industry, whether this is for a PMSA or a self-assessment, I can't emphasize that enough. So why are we doing that? Well, first off, I want to make sure that you're in compliance with the clauses, that you've covered all of those issues, the government property clause, any subcontracts clauses, any agency-specific clauses like the DFARS clauses in 252, 245, 7001 through 7004, or DFARS 252-211-7007, uh, the reporting for the IUID requirements out there. If you have chosen to use any VCSs, yes, I want to see that they're cited, but also uh, I want to see how you said you were going to apply them. Oh, well, we, we just incorporated 2132 into our procedures and said we'll follow that. No, 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 no. You, you can't just take the VCS, slap it into the middle part of your your system, your procedures, and say you're going to, you need to explain how you're going to do that, how that VCS has application in your environment. If you're using ILPs, same thing, industry leading practices like if you're using a Six Sigma or a statistical process control methodology, cite which reference you're using, and again, explain to me how you're going to apply it. Customary commercial practice is a little bit more difficult as they may not have as much uh, a literature supporting them as a VCS or as an ILP would. Therefore, you're going to have to research them and then tell me how you're going to apply them. Be careful about saying, well, this is the way we've always done it, so it's got to be good. That argument may not hold water. And some of you know I, I use the analogy about getting speeding tickets. Uh, uh, if you've gotten more more than one or two or three or four or five or even six speeding tickets, well, you got six speeding tickets, you shouldn't be driving anymore. But uh, if you got a couple speeding tickets and the officer pulled you over, did you say to him or her, sir, ma'am, but this is the way I always drive. Just because you've gotten away with something in the past doesn't mean that it's right today. So uh, you're going to be looking for coverage. You're going to be looking for uh, application about the requirements that are set forth there, right? Um, doing a self-assessment, uh, definitely we're going to be looking at processes. And 2936 calls out the processes that are used within the government property clause, 52 245-1, paragraph F, uh, 1I through X, call out 10 processes with really 
uh, 15 embedded process segments. But in, in practicality, there can be larger numbers of process segments depending upon how you've structured your procedures. In fact, I did one exercise where I came up with 36 different process segments depending upon how a contractor's property management system operated. So what processes are you going to, you should annotate those, you should create that listing and the analysis of process and process segment before you even start your review. Your populations, how are you going to define those populations? And then what methodologies are you going to use in this, right? Are you going to use statistical sampling? Are you going to use non-statistical methodologies, that being judgment sampling or purposive sampling uh, to do your work? So all of this is prep work before you start actually going and doing your self-assessment. Now, I got to talk about statistics a little bit because I found this to be a real weakness uh, for many of our folks in the property community. Uh, in my informal canvassing, I find many times that a few people have taken classes in statistics. So my encouragement, every single one of you must take a class in statistics. Why? Our world is chock full of statistics. Unless you understand those things, you might be making some false assumptions or not understanding how certain things uh, occur within the world of business applications, and property management is one of those. So from, the, from a couple of different standpoints, we, the government and industry, use statistical methods and non-statistical methods in testing, assessing, analyzing a contractor's property management system. It gives us a nice snapshot in time of the contractor's performance, and there may be times where we want to use non-statistical methods. That's fine. Here are definitions. I really don't want to bore you with that aspect. Of, of what's the difference between a statistic, statistics, and statistical inference. Uh, let me just do the last one, because we use statistical inference or inferential statistics, and that is the process of using observations of a sample. Okay, so we're going to look at a sample from our population to estimate the properties of that population, the conformance, the compliance of that larger population with the requirements. Here's our definition of inferential statistics, the process of drawing information from sampled observations of a population and making conclusions about that population, making conclusions that were drawn from the sample that I can go back and then say, this represents the larger population, the larger population. So there's a visual. On the left, we have our population. Smack dab in the middle, we pull a small sample, depending upon 2936 or the DOD guidance, and then we can generalize, if that sample was random, generalize back to that, that larger population. Maybe I should have done that picture as a circle versus uh, just going from one to the other, right? You, you see things that you can change every time you do a presentation. So. We use inferential statistics. You don't have time to review every item in a population. No, you, can you imagine our staffing levels if we had to do that? But with statistical methodologies, random sampling, it provides us with a known degree of validity and reliability. And it's an economical method employed successfully for hundreds of years, it's useful in testing attributes, transactions. So. We can select a random sample of a population, analyze its characteristics, and then generalize, generalize, infer back to that population from which the sample was selected. In other words, we make inferences. We select the sample. We analyze its characteristics, in this case, looking for defects or deficiencies or inadequacies. And then we can say, oh, look, from what we found, the larger population has the same concerns, the same defects, deficiencies, uh, inadequacies that, that we're, we're looking at, right? We make inferences from the sample back to the larger population. So what in the world is a population? 
this text that I referenced, Statistics of Spectator Sport, is, is no longer available as a, as a uh, print copy of first edition per se. Amazon sells them, but I love this book because if you are not a numbers crunching person, if you don't love algebra, if you don't love formulas, this book is written totally in words without a single formula. It explains to you what is going on within a sample or a sampling process or an algebraic formula underneath uh, that, that world of statistics. Great book. I would recommend you see if there are any out there on Amazon. So our population is any collection of objects or individuals, or in our case, maybe records or, or receiving reports or inventory schedules for disposal that have at least one characteristic in common. We're going to look at that characteristic. In inferential statistics, one usually wishes to determine the value of some characteristics. And with that, then, our populations are the objects of generalization and inferential statistics. Here's 2936. For the purposes of auditing a contract property management system, a population may consist of a collection of assets, a physical inventory, or an inventory of material, records, documents, locations, or even actions or transactions that have common characteristics for that process, right? But here's where we run into problems. If you do not clearly define, properly define, and select your population, you will come up with, the fancy word is, specious binding. And that's not good. It's really called a population specification error. And this type of error occurs when the researcher selects an inappropriate population or universe from which to obtain data. And I see it all the time. So, hey, let me ask you to think about 52.245-1, paragraph F1, and we're going to look at use or utilization. Under utilization, there are four sub-processes, use, consumption, storage, and movement. If I was to use as my population all records of all government property and use it to test uh, um, consumption, Potentially, what could be my population specification error? Well, that's a rhetorical question right now, but I'm going to answer it for you. Wait a minute. If you have ST, special tooling, special test equipment, and equipment in that population, and you're testing consumption, wait a minute. ST, ST and equipment are not consumed. Only material is consumed. You have a population specification error. And you can do the same thing by testing use and having material items in the population. You have a population specification error because you're testing an outcome with an ill-defined population. So I see it all the time, and it's really a, a critical one. That, that's a mistake. We need to be careful about that. Uh, some other texts, I pulled a, a site from Gas. I pulled a site from Aaron Lebecki. Uh, good books. I love books to support positions I take uh, to support why I'm saying something. It's not just Doug's opinion. Rather, this comes from the established literature, and it's important that you know that literature there. So within our self-assessment, we had 10 processes or 15 process segments or 36 divisions that could be structured, or 22, or however many is applicable to your procedures. But it, that's where it, it's it, how many processes are there, Doug? And the two word answer rears its ugly head. It depends upon your procedures. A little mom and pop shop, I may only come up with eight, but a large uh, megalithic contractor out there, I might be looking at 30 or 35 different processes based upon the way they've structured the, their outcomes and their process. So I need to look at certain things. I need to look at the source of my population. What are the documents that drive this population, those actions? Are there classes of property that are, come into play for framing a population? And I just mentioned that for use, it would be SDSD and equipment. For consumption, it would be material. If I'm dealing with a review of storage, then locations are going to come into play. I need to understand what are the supporting documents, not the source documents, but documents
statements that support the transactions that have occurred uh, under certain areas. And I've seen a lot of confusion with people uh, confusing what is a source document to define their population and what is a supporting document that will give evidence of the attributes under that population. All of this relates to self-assessments there. Uh, populations, again, I have to go back to the ASDM standard because, again, we encourage, uh, government encourages you to use those. Uh, population of a contractor for self-assessment, the proper definition and selection of population or populations when using statistical sampling or testing the FAR property is a critical component of performing uh, a, a CSA. Maximum number of items possible. Common characteristics. We talked about that. We also have to be concerned with this issue of whether this is a transactional or non-transactional. Wait, wait, no, notice I have, huh? What? What the heck does that mean? Well, I'm glad you asked. Transactional items are based upon an action occurring. For example, acquisitions of government property are considered an action. The receiving of government property is considered an action. The disposition of government property is considered an action. And when we use a transactional or, or defining a population based upon transactions, then we're told by the literature to go back one year or to the last analysis, whichever is less. So anytime we're dealing with transactional items, there will be a time frame imposed as to those actions that have occurred. Non-transactional is driven by, by attributes, by attributes, right? Where uh, these can be static issues. For example, um, all locations where, where property is stored, really critical issue there. Estimated quantities, estimated number of records out there. So lots of different things can be treated as a ever areas areas locations can be treated as a non-transactional items generally not driven by a time frame but we may find that a time frame is a subset for certain things under attributes gas talks about sampling generally accepted auditing standards Examining the documentation of every single transaction that occurs in a business, i.e. defense contract property management or NASA or Department of Energy or uh, uh, the colleges and universities or even the state's government is very costly and time consuming. Most audits do not require the amount of evidence. Purpose of sampling is to examine less than 100%. An auditor can draw a conclusion as long as they properly sampled. Time and cost. Testing may prove destructive. You certainly do not want to test every bomb built by a contractor. Okay, so that, that was supposed to be funny. All right, I just thought it was humorous, right? Accuracy is another reason. If you have somebody reviewing thousands of items to do a 100% review, um, that can cause errors just because you get tired. So look at the last part in red. Studying a well-defined sample may provide more accurate results than a sloppy survey of the entire population. Now, we also have to worry about statistical sampling or non-statistical. Yes, we can use both, but statistical sampling is, is the more powerful one. It gives us a quantification of, right? In non-statistical sampling, uh, your conclusions are based upon your judgment, what you think is good. Your sample size, determined by two drivers, population, and the sampling of the characteristic. So when you're pulling a random sample, here are the rules that you got to follow. Rule number one, they must be random. Those numbers selected must be random. Number two, randomness is essential. Must remember that. And if you forget any of that, Read rules one and two again. I'm sorry, you still got to do that. If you don't select random samples uh, uh, through using sample tables or things of that nature, you can get in trouble. And I use examples of having the tallest person in the class and the shortest person in the class go into a stock room and ask them, 
where do you think you would select in that stock room on the shelves? And it becomes so clearly evident that there's a bias there. You need to be careful in random samples to eliminate that bias. Yeah, lots of ways to get random sample numbers. I mentioned the randomizer in Excel and stuff like that. I mentioned this. You can use sequential number selection so long as they are random. So long as they are random, you're doing okay there. And then once you have your random sample numbers, you have to relate that back to your population. Now, if we're dealing with computer printouts, that's generally relatively easy. Why? Because one hopes that that computer printout will be sequentially numbered. We hope that. If not, you're going to have to figure out what those numbers are, generally 34 items on each page or however many, and then determine what numbers relate to which sample items, right? Now, judgment samples. Oh, this is where things get bad. If you're using judgment sampling, there are no set number of samples to select. You use your judgment. You use your professional judgment. But here's the problem. Your findings are not generalizable back to the population from which you selected them. You may direct the contractor or internally direct your workers to, to fix those defects you found, but because you're not using probability methodology, they are not generalizable. You cannot say, fix the system. You can't do that. And that's an error I find. All, well, Doug, I, I found all these mistakes. They, they have to fix their system. Well, again, it depends. I would say first, no, they only need to fix those defects disclosed. Judgment samples are not generalizable, and that's well documented in the, the literature. <clears throat> the third thing that we started was called purposeful or purposive sampling, and that was given all the way back in the old DOD property manual and, and the DAU, AFID and DAU system analysis classes. Purposeful sampling is only used when there are systemic systemic defects that have been known or reported, uh, where there are significant defects that have been known and reported to you within your company where you want to use those to see if this is a frequent occurrence. In, in, in research, it's called a snowball effect to see if there are similar occurrences, if this is a, a snowball rolling down a hill that has picked up other occurrences or whether this is an isolated occurrence. Purposeful sampling is only for known or reported big defects. There's no population. There's no random sampling. You are looking at an occurrence that has happened that's bad, not good. Now, we could walk you through each of the processes called out, but I, I don't have time to do that in one hour. We could spend a whole week doing that. But I do want to focus on another area that I find is really problematic, and that is the analysis of data. So you got the self-assessment done. You got enormous amounts of data on your worksheets providing compliance into the PMS application, uh, compliance to the FAR, VCSs. This is your audit evidence. Audit evidence is required by every single book out there and GAS and GAGAS. So now what do you go, got to do with it? You got big data there. Well, you got to analyze that data. And how do you do it? It depends. There are lots of different applications out there and lots of different errors that we may have found. Uh, multiple different compliance issues that you did well, multiple different compliance issues that you did not do well. Are they all the same in terms of significance or criticality? Not necessarily. And we have to think about that. So when we're looking at data, we should be looking for systemic defects. I am not looking for the nitnoid. I am not looking for the nitpicks. I'm not looking at the nickel and dime items. I'm looking at where the government or the contractor bears the greatest risk. If I'm going to write you up on uh, a, a miscount of screws where they're worth a dime each, well, I'll, I'll show you what I mean a little bit later here. So we need to look at this from multiple perspectives. First one, sample item. Second one, sample 
single item element. Huh? What? Well, if we structured a worksheet, I want to look at things horizontally, looking at the sample item in toto. I want to analyze the data vertically, looking at each column they're heading, what is referred to as a sample item element, and see if there are defects within that. From that, I have to make a determination. Are these systemic or are these non-systemic? I'm going to give you another step, though, that I like even better than this, all right? So within 2936, we have different confidence tables. Here's one of them, all right? You've all probably seen this before. There's the 95%, the 97. We have the sample size in column two. We have the rejection rates in column four. We have the second sample determinant in column five. Study this chart. You should be familiar with it. So other standards have uh, different acceptance or rejection rates. Uh, the a uh, ASTM 2234 is really the old MIL standard 105D or MIL standard 105E that many from the quality assurance realm uh, might have used. Whichever one you're using, make sure to use it properly. So I'm looking at defects. I don't want to focus on minor defects, minor clerical errors, transposition errors that are not significant, bulk quantity count errors that are caused by scale count. Those type of minor defects should not be the basis for finding a process or process segment inadequate. I'm looking for two other issues, significance and materiality. Significance and materiality that are out there. Two terms you're gonna hear, significance and material, materiality, what are those? Here we go. Significance and performance of an audit is that uh, you have to decide the type and extent of audit work to perform. And when evaluating re the results, right, in the performance audit standards, the term significant is compared to the term material. Not material is not bolts, screws, and washers, but that this is important. You need to be aware of importance. Significance is defined also in GAGAS there. Such factors deal with significance as a matter of, uh, uh, in relationship to the subject matter. If we're dealing with uh, classified uh, technology and you lose that, I think that's significant. If you lose nuts, bolts, screws, and washers that are a penny or a nickel or a dime each, and, and they're in lower standards in terms of a statistical process control, I don't care. And we iterate, reiterated that within the DFARS for the loss clause under DOD saying, look, we understand those little, little losses are going to occur. I'm not concerned with it. Materiality, all right? Uh, relating to the importance or significance of an amount, transaction, or discrepancy. There are those two words again. It depends. Do I worry about a 10 cent wash or a late posting a wrong location? It depends. You have to analyze that with your judgment. Here's the test, ladies and gentlemen. So you're doing a self-assessment on the process of records. You find that there were four sample items from 34 where the physical count differed from the record count. In sample item number three, you were over by six items. Sample number seven, you were uh, over by one. Sample number 13, you were over by nine. Uh, you were short nine. Sample number 27, you were short 20. Uh, is this process to be rated adequate or inadequate? Now, it's a rhetorical question because I give you the answer. You can't answer it. I haven't provided you sufficient information. The answer is it depends. It depends. You need to do a qualitative approach. It's just as important as looking at the numbers. Qualitatively, you have to determine, is this significant? Is this material? Quantitatively, good. But you also need to determine stuff qualitatively. So now here is some data in regard to those four defects. Sample item number three were six cent washers, the common hardware. Sample item number seven was worth $1.50. Bolts, common hardware. Sample number 13, 
the short nine items. They were non-sensitive little circuit cards, seven dollars. Uh, sample item twenty-seven, sixty-two dollars and forty cents. They were tubes of non-toxic glue, right? The total value of government material in the contractor's inventory, two point nine million. You really think you're going to hold them? A act as that as saying that this is a significant defect level four car for $70 worth of stuff. There was no significance. There was no materiality. But now change this one. We have sample number three. They were six vials of tetrodotoxin. Uh, those of you who like sushi, it was fugu pufferfish. That can kill you. One vial of active tetanus used in medical research. Nine samples of polonium used for nuclear research, which can kill people. Or 50 caliber ballistic uh, rounds, armor piercing rounds. Uh, now, do you think I would write them up as having significant material defects? Absolutely. Quantitatively, it's $70. But qualitatively, the items that were discrepant, not a, not a good deal. So when you review your sample, you need to look at it quantitatively and qualitatively significance and materiality looking at this single process as well as n toto and there's toto from wizard of oz there uh sorry that was another bad joke right so what about judgment samples moving away from stat you don't use acceptance for rejection rates you use your professional judgment but i urge you be careful ladies and gentlemen be careful about using judgment samples they sometimes can be problematic, right? Uh, last couple of things, causality. You've done your analysis. You've gotten your big data. Now I need to find out what caused these defects. And there are lots of things that, can look, that we can look at doing a root cause analysis. If these are non-systemic defects, fix the defects you found. If these are systemic defects, you need to determine what is the underlying cause of those defects or problems or errors? In other words, fix the system. We need to look beyond defects and determine the root cause of the systemic defects, analyze the process one way, root cause analysis, lots of different ways to do this. Of course, the Six Sigma study, fishbone, Schuhart diagrams, lots of stuff out there. So what are we looking for here? Look, I've had only one hour to go through a self-assessment our desired end state to look at our system and determine whether it is adequate or compliant. If we find areas that are inadequate, then we need to fix the system. So on that point, I had one hour to do this. It is now 2.58, which leaves us two, questions, two minutes for questions. Jessica, are you there? I am. We have a queue, so we will get started with them and then Doug, you tell me when we need to cut it off. Um, okay. So first question, who determines what is a significant finding? Is this defined or left to interpretation? It is left to interpretation, but here's what I would do if I'm doing self-assessments. Internally, I would determine what is significant before I started my audit. Now the problem is uh, with the government, we have a variety of different people who are out there uh, doing audits. And any time we approach human nature, we're all different. I'm sorry. If I could fix that, I'd be as rich as Bill Gates. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. Next question. The requirement says that self-assessments need to be made available to the government PA. Does that mean we need to report the assessment results to the PA once we have them, or do we wait for the PA to ask for them? Yeah, that's really cool. And, and that, actually, that question actually came up during the FAR rewrite. Um, in, in the old days, uh, we were asking the question, well, uh, do, do we want the, these uh, findings to be sent to us by email, by letter, by certified mail? How do we want to be notified? Um, there was no guidance. Guys, I would put that into your procedures also as a contractor. I would put that into the procedures, which are then approved by the contracting officer, at least in DOD. Uh, put that into procedures that say, look, 
upon arrival for the, the PMSA, we'll provide that. Or when you give us our 30-day notice for coming in to do an audit, we will then provide you that. In the interim, though, contractors, you'd better be taking corrective action such that when they come in to do their audit, you can say, look, this was a defect we found through our self-assessment. We have corrected that. Here is our corrective action. This is what we did. We hope that you find us adequate as well. Great question. Thank you. Next question. If your findings indicate something happens frequently, but it's easy to resolve, does that have to be considered significant? For example, process requires uploading of receipt docs to the system. Custodians have receipts, but don't upload them half the time. Is this significant? Uh, yeah, yeah. Because of that example you gave me, I would consider that a systemic defect. Have you established in your procedures the methodology for application? Yes, we could get into a big brouhaha over the issue of, well, what do we mean by periodic and promptly and timely within a reasonable period of time? Uh, don't want to go there today. That could be subject to another talk. But look, I would look at your procedures, and if your workers are not doing what they are supposed to do, and you have not defined for us uh, the timely performance standard, I, I would probably say, and, and you just told me that they don't do it half the time, you have a systemic significant defect for that, especially because of DFARS 252-211-7007, where you're supposed to report that to the IUID registry. So yeah, that one example. But let me give you another example where it's not. In your inventory stock room, you have nuts, bolts, screws, washers, and you're short five or seven or, or even 10 of them or even 20 of them, and they're worth a penny a piece. In that situation, I don't think you have a systemic defect. And that's allowed by the loss provisions in DFARS 252.245. It says that, it clearly called out, that normal inventory adjustments as determined by the PA and the contractor, uh, agreed to by the PA and the contractor, are, are not losses. Don't bother me with those because they're, penny, they're normal manufacturing process losses. So one example I think is systemic. The other example is not. Now you've got me excited. My blood pressure's up. <laughs> okay, next question. Is there a sample self-assessment report that models how we should describe the statistical methodologies used? Um, I, I know that NDIA has put out a goodly amount of information. So if you were to just do a Google search NDIA, and then government property management, it will take you to that page and you can see what they have there. Uh, um, I, I can't give you a formulaic approach uh, to do that uh, within a, a class that I do on audits. Uh, I have uh, some discussion about how to write narratives because uh, people are sometimes weak in, in the writing skills, but no, I, 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 don't, I don't have a methodology, a formula or a template uh, to do that. I, I can't help you there. Thank you. Next question. Is the difference between judgment and purposeful sampling really just the reason you choose the sample? For example, professional judgment that there might be a problem versus a problem that was previously identified? Okay. Purposeful would be for a problem a big problem that has been previously identified. Judgment sample, uh, 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 you are not going in there pre uh, uh, presupposing that there was a problem. You are pulling a judgment sample because it doesn't lend itself to statistical sampling. For example, storage in a warehouse. I will probably use judgment sampling walking through the storage areas of that warehouse to see uh, is housekeeping adequate, is it cleanliness, is it protected, are uh, they secure, uh, secure so that engineers can't walk through it and take stuff, oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't talk about engineers. Uh, people can't walk through the warehouse and just take stuff anytime. That would lend itself to a judgment sampling. 
vis-a-vis uh, storage would lend itself to judgment sampling vis-a-vis other statistical approaches of say where you have 30 different storage areas where I could set up a statistical sample of that storage area. So don't, don't, don't confuse judgment sampling and go in that, well, I know where the skeletons are buried. Uh-uh, you don't know where the skeletons are buried. You're not supposed to be going in in that way. These are the purposeful where you do know that there were significant occurrences, either either um, that has been uh, that has occurred within the company, or even that you reported to DCMA or ONR or uh, or any of the audit agencies as, as an actual loss or occurrence. Uh, famous incident of dropping a large satellite that was then subject to purposeful sampling. How many times do you drop a satellite? Okay, that sort of leads us into this question, can a combination of statistical and judgment sampling be considered acceptable? Absolutely, absolutely. So long as you can document why you did that, but keep in mind, stat sampling, I can generalize back to the entire system. Judgment sampling, I can only direct the correction of those defects that I found efficient in my judgment, okay? I can't say, oh, you need to rewrite your procedures in this whole section. No, judgment sampling only allows you, you cannot generalize. It only allows you to tell the contractor or internally fix what you found def uh, defective. Thank you. And that's a mistake everybody makes all the time. <laughs> Next question. If you are looking at several types of reports, IUID, law, financial, or contractual, do you have to use four populations or can you randomize them as one population for reports? Oh, that's gorgeous. Oh, oh, wait a minute, who asked that question? No, 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 I'm sorry, Jessica, I'm kidding. Um, here you go, you ready? You know what the answer is gonna be. It depends. How did you structure that in your uh, property management system. Did you include all reports under one process or did you break out the reporting requirement uh, driven by the process that it relates to? All right, now, now we had that same problem in the FAR rewrite where at some point we threw a whole bunch of reports together under uh, uh, the, the reporting requirement under paragraph F. And then later in, in one of the later revisions, we broke it out because we had made a boo-boo there. It fit more better uh, with, within each appropriate linked process to discuss reporting vis-a-vis -vis just uh, um, lumping them all together under reports. So two word answer, I'm sorry, it depends. I would sit down and read your procedures. If you broke them out under the separate process under which it applied, I would treat them as a separate population. If you did all inclusive, then you have a better argument to say, no, no, we're testing the process of submitting reports and here it's all done under this one process. So really you, you, you might have trapped yourself by including it elsewhere, but I would need to see your procedures to answer that question. Oh, these are, these are really cool questions. I know, there's so many. Um, okay, next question. Can you reference self-assessment guidelines for grants? Oh, oh boy. Um, okay, uh, anything that I taught today has applicability from a population and a sampling perspective and a planning perspective. Your criteria are going to be different. You're gonna be using the criteria set forth in the uniform guidelines published by OMB. So if you're dealing with grants, if you're dealing with cooperative agreements, I'd look at the OMB uniform uh, uh, applications there, uniform guidance, you know, the old A110, A21 requirements. Uh, I would also look at the Dodgers to see what applications the government's going to be looking at. And, and no, I'm, I'm not talking about the Los Angeles Dodgers. I'm talking about the DOD grants uh, 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 guidebook that's out there, right? Um, so anything I covered today has 
good foundational applicability. The difference would be the processes, outcomes, and criteria that are, are binding within uh, uh, the grants and cooperative agreement world. Thanks, Doug. I think we have time for just one more question here. Um, so the last one is, can you provide a sample or a place where we can find a sample of a completed self-assessment? Um, a completed self-assessment, okay. Um, no, no, I can't. Now, now the reason for that is companies uh, generally don't like to air their dirty laundry. That's a bad phrase. Neither does the government. But the point being, they, they probably would not want to share that uh, as to how that was done. But again, I would refer you to the NDIA page. They, they have some good stuff there. Um, there. There is, God willing, uh, going to be that uh, primer on self-assessments and property management system analysis. God willing, it will be out there by the NES. So at that point, you can support the NPMA and uh, buy a book and read how it's done in, in 300 pages. <laughs> it's, it's a lengthy book. Awesome. Thanks, Doug. And I'll say, you know, if there are any other questions that come up today, you know, the SIG forum, particularly the contract property SIG in this case, is a great place to put some of these questions and we can all help each other out and respond to those as a team. And I think that's all we have for today, Doug. Any last? Very good. Thank you for all the folks that have been online. I uh, hope that in one hour, we were at least able to give you an overview. So again, thank you, Jessica. Thanks, everybody out there. Thanks. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye.